In September 1979, the tranquil beauty of the Oregon wilderness was shattered by the sound of gunfire. Some people were here relaxing and having a good time, and suddenly it became something not so beautiful. A cold-blooded murderer was on the loose, and a quiet community was gripped by fear. People at the time, you know, the basic, well, we're not going up the river unless we got a gun along, because somebody was out there and could kill you. September 1979. The state of Oregon on the Pacific coast is a natural paradise of mountains, rivers, and evergreen forests. It also contains the quiet seaside community of Brookings. Brookings is spread out slightly up into the mountains that come down within oh, about a half or three quarters of a mile to the ocean. It's very picturesque, very rural, very forest covered mountainous land with beautiful, clear streams running down to the ocean. In the late 70s, there were approximately 1,500 people who lived in the city of Brookings. It was a very uh, pristine, quiet place, kind of off the beaten path. We had our share of crime, of course, but most of it was property-type crime. I mean, it may go years be between anything that would even come close to a homicide at that time. Brookings Harbor was also the site of a U.S. Coast Guard station, responsible for patrolling the Pacific coastline. Uh, we were used to having a lot of Coast Guard youngsters, young men and women there. Uh, we worked with them a lot, very close to the Coast Guard, and uh, uh, always got along well with them and, and uh, a lot of respect for them. One of those youngsters was Ricky Dale Hemphill, a hardworking bosun's mate just a month from his 20th birthday. Uh, Ricky was uh, an amiable young man, not very tall, fairly slim, had a reddish hair, kind of a pale complexion, good-looking young man. He was well thought of in terms of his work ethic. He seemed to be pretty friendly with most of the people he worked with and uh, got along well, for the most part, with people. He was primarily involved in search rescue efforts with the Coast Guard. As a result of one memorable recent rescue, Ricky had met his new girlfriend, 18-year-old Charlotte Toma. Miss Toma was uh, a young lady from uh, Lincoln City, Oregon. She uh, was a deckhand on a commercial fishing boat, and apparently the boat had had some problems and was towed into the Brookings Coast Guard station by the Coast Guard crew there. And that's when I understanding is where she met Ricky Hemphill. She was a very pretty girl, petite, had a, a nice figure, was probably pretty active, dark hair, dark eyes. And apparently uh, there was some attraction there and uh, uh, got to going out together. And she apparently decided that being a commercial fisherman wasn't the life for her and uh, ended up staying around the area and uh, dating Mr. Hemphill. As far as I know, at that point, uh, they were going to be seeing each other constantly, possibly living together. As it was described to me, they were pretty close very quickly. Friday the 7th of September was no exception. It was Ricky Hampill's day off, and he and Charlotte had spent the morning together. Ricky brought her to the Coast Guard station to introduce her to his friends when he told everybody that they were going up the Chetco River. On the way, Ricky stopped at the home of his friend Ed Young, a cook at the Coast Guard station. Ed wasn't home, but his landlady spotted Ricky's new pickup truck in the driveway. On Saturday, the 8th of September, Ricky Hemphill was supposed to be back at work, but he failed to report for duty at the Coast Guard station. I think the Coast Guard probably was waiting to see if he was going to show up to work, uh, but there were no reports that he was missing. Ricky was still missing the next day, when his friend Ed Young and a cousin, Karen Cole, went to the remote spot that Ricky and Charlotte had planned to visit. When they noticed a sleeping bag on the gravel riverbank, they decided to investigate. And they pulled back their sleeping bag that was laying there just a little ways off the water and found Mr. Hemphill's body there. Well, obviously, uh, 
the cousin was quite upset, and uh, their first reaction was to get the police uh, to report uh, the, the location of the body. It wasn't long before investigators from Brookings and Curry County arrived at the scene. When I arrived on the scene, Ricky Hemphill was in a blue sleeping bag lying on the gravel bar of the bank of the Chetco River. As I recall, his feet were headed toward uh, the downriver side and his head was toward the upriver side, laying on the bank parallel to the water. Well, I remember at the time seeing two holes, if you will, in his back. And having been around guns all my life, I was pretty certain that they were bullet holes. That was my first indication or first reaction was is that uh, Ricky had been shot and he had been shot in the back. We collected everything that we found uh, within a wide perimeter of the location of Hemp Hill's body, including checking the water for any evidence. Uh, his wallet and ID were in the water. Uh, all those things were recovered. We had uh, beer containers that were recovered, 45 caliber shell casings, uh, of course, the sleeping bag that was thrown over his body, the piece of jewelry that uh, was found nearby. Uh, some of the images that kind of stand out in my mind of the crime scene is that how peaceful and quiet it was there on a gravel bar by the river and a beautiful, uh, beautiful spot. But at the same time, here it is, it's a homicide scene. Further discussions with Ed Young and Karen Cole alerted investigators to the fact that Ricky Hemphill may not have been alone and that his brand new Chevy pickup truck was missing. When Ricky Hemphill's body was found, uh, we didn't realize that Carla was with him uh, or what his vehicle looked like until we learned from his cousin and the Coast Guardsman that found the body. We checked the immediate vicinity and didn't find either one of them. So at that point, uh, we considered her a missing person in the vehicle, uh, missing vehicle. Through talking with the Coast Guard and uh, friends at the Coast Guard, we were able to, of course, get his uh, description of the pickup and also the license plate number that the pickup had. So we were able to broadcast that to uh, local news media and also to law enforcement agencies. Police conducted a sweep of the area, searching the woods and talking to anyone who might have seen Charlotte Toma or the missing pickup truck. When you're looking in a house or something, you've got distinct parameters. When you're searching things outdoors in rural areas, you've got to expand your search considerably. And so we did a broad, broad search and had people searching arm in arm through brush and things, looking for footprints, looking for anything that might have been dropped by the victim, victims, or the suspect, those kinds of things. We needed to locate Rick's truck because we figured uh, it might contain evidence of what might have happened to Charla or who else might have been involved in the homicide. Uh, we put helicopters up in the air to check the vicinity for the truck. Uh, nothing was located. Although the thick undergrowth could easily have concealed the vehicle, the police also considered the possibility that the pickup and Charlotte Toma were no longer in the area. It was still not clear what Charlotte's connection was to the death of Ricky Hemphill. Well, at that point, we had no idea. We didn't know whether she, she was part of the criminal act or whether she had been kidnapped. It was a guessing game at this point. The 11th of September, 1979. In Curry County, Oregon, the police were investigating the murder of Ricky Dale Hemphill. The 19-year-old Coast Guard had been found dead at a riverside picnic area 17 miles east of the town of Brookings. The police were also eager to locate his 18-year-old girlfriend, Charlotte Toma, last seen traveling with Hemphill in his Chevy pickup, which had also vanished. The investigation of Rick's death uh, primarily involved interviews with between 75 and 100 different people. Uh, we interviewed anybody that knew anything about their relationship, anybody that knew her prior to the time they got together. Back in 79, Charlotte seemed to have been kind of a free spirit. 
She was roaming around uh, doing whatever she wanted, when she wanted, where she wanted. She had uh, worked part-time jobs before she went uh, to work on the Sunshine fishing vessel. Seemed to me that she was trying to make enough money to go to Hawaii in a year or so. It takes a, you know, a pretty tough young lady to work in a fishing vessel. That's not an easy job. So, you know, she was not a uh, soft lady. She had, uh, had a hard side to her that was capable of working. Jewelry found by the river was identified as belonging to Charlotte Toma, which placed her at the scene. But it didn't explain why Ricky Hemphill had been shot. We interviewed Coast Guard, his work partners, and uh, anybody and everybody that might know Ricky Hemphill and uh, know about his activities and uh, know about what uh, might be going on in his life. Uh, there's always a possibility that, that it was a drug deal that went bad or something. Uh, uh, those things are all, uh, all investigated. We got a lot of background information about uh, Charla and Rick, uh, but very little that was gonna really aid us in the investigation about the homicides. A post-mortem of Ricky Hemphill uncovered another piece of evidence with some difficulty. We had an entrance wound, no exit wound, so subsequently knew that the bullet had to be inside the body. We were having real problems finding it, so transported the uh, deceased over to the hospital and ended up having to do x-rays to uh, find the bullet. The 45 is uh, a fairly popular caliber, but we didn't have anything to compare the casings with or bullets with, so of course they were just uh, preserved and labeled and kept as evidence, hoping that uh, down the line we would come up with a weapon for comparison. The police were also trying to solve the mystery of Charlotte Toma. As well as being a potential eyewitness to the shooting, investigators were concerned for her safety. The last time uh, her parents heard from her was a few days before the homicide of Rick Hemphill. And uh, what we did was handle it like a typical missing person after that because we had no indication uh, of where to look. The media reported Charlotte Thomas' disappearance simply as she was last known to be with the Coast Guardsman, and it was we didn't know whether she had run away and was hiding, uh, whether she had been killed, or whether she was being held hostage. And uh, we were, of course, highly concerned that if somebody had committed one homicide, they probably weren't above committing another one. And so we were doing everything that was possible to try to locate the pickup and consequently locate Charla. We eventually put out all points bulletins uh, with her description. We had photographs uh, that were given to the newspapers and the news media to, to uh, be printed up. The community of Brookings reacted to the murder with a considerable amount of horror because people were used to very calm, uh, peaceful settings up the, up the river. Uh, it was a time when you could actually set up a camp out up the Chetco River. You could leave your tent and all your material there. People did not lock their doors at home. So people began to look over their shoulders after that incident. Deer hunting season was just opening up, which meant a lot of people were gonna be in the mountains. A lot of phone calls to the sheriff's office about whether they should go up there or not. And uh, we know the Forest Service people were concerned because obviously we didn't know what we had in the mountains there. We had a dead body, we had somebody shot and killed, and uh, uh, they were concerned as to what they were going to run into up there. By the 2nd of October, 1979, it had been almost a month since Ricky Hemphill's murder on the banks of the Chetco River. Forestry service worker Al Frank was patrolling a densely wooded tract two miles outside the area searched by the police immediately after the shooting. Mr. Frank had been up there checking on a particular area seven or eight miles past where Hemphill's body had been found and had spotted this pickup parked up on one of the small spur roads and from the newspaper uh, reports and uh, the police looking for this pickup, he immediately recognized that it was the pickup that we'd been looking for and made contact. Detectives from the Oregon Bureau of Criminal Investigation, the Oregon State Police, and the Curry County Sheriff's Department carefully combed the vehicle for clues. 
It was uh, processed uh, for fingerprints, and every article within the truck was uh, picked up and examined as possible evidence. The truck itself had been wiped pretty clean. We found some items that obviously belonged to a female, and we surmised that they probably belonged to Miss Toma. The truck itself gave us another point to start searching from, and so we started again another circle search out from that area and started spreading out from that point. The search team scoured the area for any evidence that might lead them to a suspect, or worse, to the body of Charlotte Toma. Of course, one of the things that comes to mind is a possible sexual attack. And in my own mind, I'm thinking, is there any places, any locales that might be a little bit more conducive to uh, anything on this order? And that's kind of what brought a cabin to mind to me. I vaguely remembered that there seemed like there used to be an old miner's cabin somewhere there pretty close. The uh, Forest Service personnel said, yeah, you know, we recall one being here too. They thought that they could show me pretty close to where it was. So myself and one of the Forest Service people took off and uh, drove on up the road a ways and started exploring and they pointed out where they thought it was and walked down in there and sure, that's where this little cabin was. And when I say cabin, this is kind of an open shelter, uh, if I recall correctly, didn't even have a door. It just. Uh, old mining type cabin, I think probably from the 50s, that basically uh, was abandoned. It's on Forest Service property, so no one had a legal right to, to really be there or live there. But when Chief Dotson approached the cabin, he discovered that it was anything but abandoned. Walked in, it was open, and uh, were able to spot some various items that looked like they possibly would be very interesting to look at a little further but it was getting dark and we didn't have really uh, the manpower and at that particular time we didn't have any evidence that directly tied in so we were going to wait till the next morning. It had gaps in the walls, a dirt floor, no furnishings. It was just basically a, a wreck of a building and very small. You'd have to be pretty used to not having conveniences to stay in a cabin like that. Because cabin is a very misleading word. It wasn't really a cabin. It was just a bunch of boards nailed together. Cabin or not, on the morning of the 3rd of October, 1979, it was clear that someone had been calling it home. We noticed quite a bit of things that appeared like they might be uh, evidence. We noticed a gun cleaning kit there. We noticed uh, various pamphlets. Uh, with paramilitary type information and wilderness survival type information and uh, quite a bit of information that appeared to be uh, in regards to uh, some type of Muslim group, but we weren't uh, definite at that point that they tied into the case. The police were looking for evidence that would confirm that the cabin was somehow connected to the death of Ricky Hemphill. Chief of police at that time, Tony Ragon from Gold Beach, police department, he came down, and he was kind of standing outside the cabin, leaning against a, a tree there. And as he was leaning against the tree, he saw something white sticking out of a little knot hole. So he started fishing around with his pocket knife there, just using up time while people were looking through the cabin for evidence, and out he pulled a little small strip of material. And that strip of material ended up being the end off of a military towel that had been issued to Mr. Hemphill and had part of his serial numbers on that towel. Our suspicions were that the towel was being used by the suspect or some of his friends, and rather than, you know, leave it laying around with our victim's name on it, he took that piece off of it, tore it off, stuffed it in there to hide it. So at that point, we knew that we were on the right track. We knew that that cabin was going to play an important role in our investigation uh, because we had something tying our victim directly to that cabin site. The search team continued to sift methodically through the shack's contents, with some success. Some key pieces of information were found in the cabin, one of them being a vehicle registration slip, uh, a pickup that uh, appeared to be fairly recent. There was a few names in the cabin, and they were started running those to see what we could find, see if any of them had any records or vehicles uh, 
register to him anything like that. The investigating team also questioned local residents who might have seen something or someone. Witnesses said that on several occasions they'd heard gunfire coming from the vicinity. One old hunter told Sam Dotson about a run-in he'd had while out tracking deer. And what he does is he tells me about some people up there with this pickup that were kind of hostile to him and he just didn't like the, the, the feeling he was getting from them. And he described the symbol on the side as being a, a star with almost like a, a trillium type symbol inside of it. And where he told me they were at turned out to be the road that is right there at the cabin. And he had also described several square cardboard boxes being in the back of this pickup. Oh, and guess what? What's inside the cabin? Numerous square cardboard boxes. Anyway, we were able to run all the names that were in the cabin for all vehicles registered to. And one of those names that was in the cabin, Gary Lee Smith, came back to the same type, year, and make vehicle that he described. Because of these things all tying together, we pretty well had an idea of what year, make, color, vehicle we were looking for with also a very possible license plate number and also with a one-of-a-kind symbols painted on the side of the doors. And we determined that whoever was staying up in that vicinity might know something about the homicide. So we put out wanted persons bulletins on those individuals. Meanwhile, investigators at the cabin discovered a network of tracks leading to outlying camps. That's when uh, the sheriff decided we needed additional people up there because we were going to have to do some more searching and we're just going to have to do it all on foot because uh, you couldn't go into this area on a, any kind of a motorized vehicle. And uh, I eventually ended up on that search crew. Well, our primary job at that point was uh, looking for people. We were looking for our suspects. and. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to run into. That some of the information they found in the cabin indicated that at least one of our people that had been there had military experience. And uh, so that kind of put us on our, on our toes, you know, to be looking, be looking out. We could be, you know, be ambushed, quite frankly. And it was just short of the river where the second camp was located. It was set up to look like a guerrilla camp to me. And it reminded me of, of camps and that I'd seen described during the Vietnam War. It was uh, quite elaborate. Uh, I had a uh, compound set up, a lot of weapons, uh, shotguns, rifles, uh, ammunition, camping gear. There was food, a lot of uh, indications that they intended to be there a long time. And in this camp, they also located the complete other end of the towel which had been at the cabin. So that in turn tied that site with all the ammunition and weapons and the cabin then was in tied back into the homicide scene with Hemphill because his property was there. As they set out to look for other camps in the area, the investigators were also searching for anything that would help solve the other half of the mystery. At this point, we didn't find anything that gave any indication of what had happened to Charlottetoma at all. Things were starting to tie together with Hemphill, but nothing tying directly in with her. The investigators needed to talk to the men who'd set up these camps, the ones seen driving the pickup truck with the strange symbol on the side. Any effort to locate a suspect or a vehicle is usually predicated by a teletype that goes out at least statewide. And uh, in this case, we put out a teletype of the vehicle in its description, uh, along with the information about uh, Gary Lee Smith in hopes that somebody would spot it and lead us to the information we wanted about Smith. We had located the second camp, and we're looking for a third one and looking for anybody that might be in the area. When the word came down that they had this vehicle stopped in Port Orford, The 4th of October, 1979. The investigation into the murder of Ricky Hemphill and the disappearance of his girlfriend, Charlotte Toma, had led investigators to an old miner's shack deep in the Oregon woods. They'd uncovered what appeared to be a remote training camp. 
complete with a cache of weapons and ammunition. They'd also found a name, Gary Lee Smith, and the registration details of a pickup truck seen in the vicinity of the cabin two miles from where Hemphill's abandoned vehicle had been found. While search teams continued to scour the Oregon forest, an all-points bulletin was issued on the pickup truck that had a unique Islamic symbol on its side. Meanwhile, near the coastal town of Port Orford, 60 miles north of Brookings, Sheriff's Deputy Doug Dickens was on a routine patrol. The truck that was spotted in Port Orford was an older, kind of a beater pickup truck with a canopy, but it had uh, three people in it. It had a religious symbol, some sort of a Mideastern symbol on the, on the doors. Uh, one of our deputies in the area, Doug Dickens, noted the vehicle description and the license number and realized it was the vehicle wanted in our bulletins and pulled it over, uh, knowing it was connected with a homicide case. For Deputy Dickens, there was nothing routine about pulling over this particular vehicle. It was a dangerous situation involving potentially violent murder suspects, known in American police lingo as a felony stop. Felony stop is considered a high-risk stop, and it's done weapons drawn because you're assuming that your vehicle has people who might be armed and considered dangerous. The officer approached the vehicle cautiously, leveling his gun at the men as they climbed out. Suddenly, one of the men made a move. He sprinted away from the truck, disappearing into thick undergrowth on a nearby hill. One of the other men also looked ready to run. The deputy ordered them to the ground at gunpoint and called for assistance. All the law enforcement efforts were being concentrated at the time in the Chetco River area where the uh, shooting had occurred. So this deputy in Port Orford was basically alone. So we had to rush officers up there to assist him. It took roughly 20 minutes for real help to get to him and most of the people took nearly an hour to get to them because we were all spread out and so far away. As local and state law enforcement officers raced to the scene, it became clear to onlookers that something was happening. We had a young reporter stationed in Gold Beach. Uh, his name was Jim Fink, and he was smart enough that when all the law enforcement went racing through the city of Gold Beach, he followed them. So we had some good news photographs of the actual incident in Port Orford. When backup finally arrived, Deputy Doug Dickens was still standing guard over his two prisoners. The third man remained at large. At that point, we were going on the assumption that he was part of the murder case we were working. I don't know just exactly how many, but you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 officers were eventually involved in that search. Port Orford, it's the community that's built right on the ocean. And there are a lot of nooks and crannies, if you will, a lot of brush, a lot of timber and whatnot, so it's easy to hide. So uh, it turned into be a fairly major search. At 2.15 p.m., a local resident reported a man scrambling through the undergrowth on a bluff west of the town. The police arranged for a Coast Guard helicopter to buzz the area. Running out of options and with nowhere to hide, George Rose was found and forced to surrender. The local news media was on hand to report the dramatic breakthrough in a case that had terrified the county. Well, the discovery of the cabin and the arrest were big time news, especially for an area like Curry County, where basically nothing ever happened. The community reacted to the arrest with a large amount of relief because it meant then that now our woods, our rivers are safe again. The three suspects were transported to the Curry County Sheriff's Office at Gold Beach. While the District Attorney's Office obtained a search warrant for their vehicle, the three men were questioned separately. One of the men was Gary Lee Smith, a 36-year-old meat cutter who'd converted to Islam in the early 70s while in prison for a drug conviction. He went by his Muslim name Dawad Abdur Rahman, and claimed to be the leader of an Islamic religious order with over 4,000 members in the United States and the Middle East. 
He felt that some real horrific times were coming, so he was trying to get him and his followers to get into the wilderness area, become self-sufficient, and uh, follow their religious practices. His statement to the officers and to uh, the investigators was that uh, he was going to set up a Muslim religious school up in the mountains in that area uh, of the Kalmyopsis Wilderness area. And that uh, a lot of his contacts were uh, Muslims that were in the state penitentiary. One of those contacts was the man who'd gone on the run in Port Orford, 34-year-old George Rose. And apparently, Mr. Dawad Rahman had been going to Oregon State Prison on various occasions, and, and I believe he was trying to recruit some various people, and Mr. Rose was one of them. He had been working with George and trying to get him to come down and become part of their group. At the time of his arrest in Port Orford, however, George Rose had not finished serving his sentence. Well, George Rose took off because, of course, he had escaped from the penitentiary system, uh, Tillamook County Work Farm up on the north coast of Oregon. Uh, he knew he was going to be identified and taken back into custody, so he was trying to avoid that. That's why he left to begin with. He thought he could hide down in the forest area in the camp in the Chetco and probably would have had the Hemp Hill Toma homicides not occurred. The third suspect was the youngest, a 26-year-old Texan named Edward Dillon Warren. Edward Dillon Warren was a strong-looking uh, young man, in his late 20s, uh, looked like somebody you'd expect to see in the out of doors. He was a large man, well-built, quiet, seemed to be self-possessed, I don't want to say he was intimidating, but he, he was intimidating. <laughs> he was a big man, and he could look at you, and you felt like you better be quiet. Edward Dalen Warren had been in and out of trouble with the law a great deal of his life. When he was taken into custody, he had warrants out for him for car theft, burglary, and carrying a concealed weapon. And he'd spent time in the penitentiary in Oregon, which is where he met uh, Gary Lee Smith when Smith came in and converted him to the Muslim religion. He came out of the system and he came to Curry County with Smith to set up a training camp for combatants in the Mideast. The police discovered that it was Warren's expertise that had helped build the weapons cache found in the Oregon woods. Mr. Warren was involved in some armed robberies and thefts. It's my understanding that he was the primary reason they had all the weapons they had, that he was burglarizing uh, sporting goods stores, uh, doing what we call smash and grabs. Uh, I know there were weapons that were found that were stolen in the camp and traced back to some sporting goods stores in the Salem area. A search of Gary Smith's truck indicated that robbery might not have been Edward Warren's only crime. When Smith's truck was pulled over in Port Orford, of course it was dealt with as a crime scene and processed accordingly. And in the process of going through a knapsack that uh, had information in it indicating that it belonged to Edward Dalen Warren, the 45 caliber semi-automatic llama pistol was located. The handgun was immediately sent to the crime lab for ballistics testing. The police stepped up their interrogation of Edward Warren they believed they finally had a link to the murder of Ricky Hemphill, but there was still no sign of the Coast Guard's missing girlfriend. None of the interviews with either Smith or Rose turned up any information about Charlottoma, and none initially turned up uh, with the interrogation of Edward Dillon Warren. At first, Warren denied ever having seen Charlottoma, but Detective Tom Benz, noticed that his eyes became misty when he was shown her photograph. The detective continued to press him, and Warren finally agreed to tell the whole story. Warren admitted that he'd been living at the miner's cabin in the woods. He'd hitchhiked into Brookings on the 7th of September to relieve his boredom. Later that day, he'd hitched a ride back. He'd been dropped off on the road just above the spot where Ricky Hemphill and Charlotte Toma were relaxing and drinking beer by the Chetco River. During the interview process, Warren told investigators that 
He came across Hap Hill and Toma on the, on the gravel bar on the Chetco River, and as he passed them, he said that Hemp Hill said something derogatory to him. He took it as an insult. And uh, for no other reason than that, he turned around and walked back behind him and shot him twice in the back. Charlotte Toma was a witness to the shooting, so Warren decided to take her with him. He said that uh, after killing Rick Hemp Hill, he had her drive him up to the cabin. And while he was doing something, Charlotte Toma ran off, clambered uphill over a bunch of downed trees in a clear-cut area, and he shot her from the road about 50 feet away. According to his statement, Carla Toma was probably killed within hours of the time that Hemphill was killed on the same day. On the 4th of October, Warren agreed to take the police to the place where Charlotte Toma had died. They found her body under a tangle of bushes and tree cuttings not far from the miner's cabin. She was badly decomposed. She'd been there for a month. It was dried blood, bones, uh, a bit of hair, a bit of clothing. There was not a lot left for us to pick up. As I recall, when we put her remains, uh, including parts of her skull, into the body bag. It weighed less than 28 pounds. I think one of the images that'll stay with me most about this case is the remains of Carla Toma's body with her little fisherman's, Greek fisherman's cap lying beside her with her name in the hat band. Evidence at the scene contradicted Warren's initial description of what had happened. When we cleared the area and looking for shell casings, we found one 16 feet away from her and found another that was only six feet away from her, which indicated he had practically executed her from close range. I don't have any idea why he might have lied about that issue because he seemed to be very straightforward about the other things that he told us. I can only surmise, you know, that it was some kind of a, a conscience thing or it might have had something to do with his religion. But without his help, we would not have been able to find her. We probably would not have found her because eventually that hillside was going to be burned off. A bullet taken from Charlotte's remains was sent to ballistics. It matched the bullet taken from Ricky Hemphill and the one test fired from the 45 caliber handgun found in Warren's bag. There was a lot of minor celebration about the capture of Warren when it occurred. Uh, of course, it was highly publicized. The radio, the newspaper, the TV picked it up. It was a really big deal because it had been such a gruesome homicide and it uh, had been one of those things where people were beginning to give up hope that we'd ever be able to solve it. Based on the evidence, Edward Dellen Warren was charged with the first degree murder of Ricky Hemphill and Charlotte Toma. Both charges carried the possibility of the death penalty. But as everyone was about to find out, the shadow of death held no fear for Edward Dellen Warren. October 1979. Residents in the tiny community of Brookings, Oregon, breathed a sigh of relief after the arrest of Edward Dellen Warren for the double murder of Ricky Hemphill and Charlotte Toma. Warren had made it clear that the men arrested with him, Gary Lee Smith and George Rose, had had nothing to do with the murders. George Rose was still in jail when the shootings had occurred, and so was Gary Smith, serving 35 days for deer poaching. Smith eventually was allowed to leave. He was released. We didn't have any criminal charges against him, and we had no indication that he had any part in the homicide. Rose, on the other hand, was wanted as an escapee from the penitentiary, so he was held until transferred back to the penitentiary. When asked about the weapons and ammunition found in and around the miner's cabin, Smith claimed they were for hunting only, necessary for survival at his wilderness retreat. The detectives involved in the case weren't so sure. At that time, the United States was having a lot of problems with Iran and the religious group that took over that country. And uh, it appeared from the information we were getting later on that uh, they intended to set up some kind of a guerrilla operation 
uh, where they would actually, uh, you know, attack uh, facilities in the United States. I'm not sure if anybody ever was able to find out too many details about uh, the group that they were going to try to form for the retreat, other than people that were followers of Raman and that he was able to convince that they ought to move to this area for survival. With no proof of intent, Gary Smith was a free man. Now, in his role as Muslim leader Dawad Abdul Rahman, he served as Edward Warren's spiritual advisor. On the 29th of October, 1979, Edward Dellen Warren appeared before the Curry County District Court in Gold Beach, Oregon. It was just a handful of people in the courtroom, just a quiet, very quiet situation. Warren's family was there. I believe it was his mother and a sister. Warren's trial was rather interesting in, in several aspects because Mr. Warren, because of his religious convictions, felt that it was his duty to plead guilty and take responsibility and that his penalty should be death for what he had done. Before a death sentence could be passed, the state had to prove that the act of murder was intentional and not in self-defense. It also had to show that Warren would kill again if given the chance. State witnesses included an Arizona police officer who'd once arrested Warren in Phoenix. He told the hearing that in the course of the arrest, Warren had been wounded after attempting to grab the officer's gun. The police officer was convinced that Edward Warren would have killed him if he'd been able to get hold of his weapon. In the courtroom, Warren's demeanor was, he was calm. He didn't try to demonstrate anything. He only spoke when spoken to. The most dramatic testimony came from Warren himself. He admitted that he'd killed Ricky Hemphill and Charlotte Toma simply because he'd lost his temper. Now, obviously, Warren was carrying the old chip on the shoulder because to become that angry at someone for making remarks about your appearance, to turn and fire to kill them, speaks about someone who's been through a lot of torment. He is, the only remorse he showed was saying that he wanted the death penalty for what he'd done. And the judge eventually granted that. The entire Brookings community was uh, very gratified by the fact that he received the death penalty. It was uh, a terrible crime that had been committed in a, a quiet little community that shocked everyone. They were glad to see it come to a close. And then sometime down the road, uh, our Oregon Supreme Court overturned that death penalty and they had to bring him back and resentence him uh, to uh, two life terms. Edward Dellen Warren's life sentence was to last 24 years. He died on the 12th of February, 2003, in an Oregon hospital at the age of 50. The case was finally closed. It was a very interesting case. And uh, I think my boss told me at one time that I'd, I'd gained about three years experience in about three months because of it. And uh, a real tragedy because two young people lost their lives. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time.